My name is Joy Pullman. I'm the executive editor of The Federalist, and you are watching The Rebound with Matt Doherty. Welcome to The Rebound with Coach Matt Doherty. Welcome to The Rebound. I'm Matt Doherty, and I'll be your host. On this show, we explore remarkable rebound stories, stories of resilience and recovery. We highlight the leadership qualities that emerge in the face of life's toughest challenges, revealing the strengths and determination that inspire us all. With me today is someone who claims that the country we once knew is under attack by our own government. How do we take it back? Let's talk with my guest on The Rebound. Her name is Joy Pullman. Joy is the executive editor of The Federalist. Her new book is The False Flag, Why Queer Politics Mean the End of America. She has authored several books, including The Education Invasion, an experienced reporter in education and politics, Joy has appeared on Tucker Carlson, CNN, and Fox News. Joy is also a graduate of Hillsdale College. Joy, thank you for being on the show. Tell us about your new book, False Flag. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really wrote the book as a mother who loves children and is very concerned by the fact that some extremely disturbing and distressing sorts of things are being done with children that a lot of people are too scared to speak out about, even though, I mean, I think that, for example, the trans issue is pretty obvious. You know, when you're talking about, um, you know, to form a, a fake uh, private part for a child cuffing off the skin from the wrist to the elbow, I think people should be able to be emboldened to speak more. But unfortunately, a lot of people, we have a climate of fear. And I am in a position where I'm able to more freely than other people speak out about that. Um, and because I'm a mother, I really, really care about, especially the effects on kids, of having a public square in which it's not safe to take your kids to a park, to a parade, to a library, you know, without them essentially being exposed to pornography. We really need to have a better country than that. We should have public places that are safe for all people, including the vulnerable, the most vulnerable, including children. And so that's why I wrote the book to really say, look, I think the American founders had a really, uh, they had an understanding of America that in order to have a self-governing people, you needed to have families at the center of that. And the sexual revolution has really taken a toll on families. And we're in now in a vicious cycle that people really uh, need to do something about if, like, like you mentioned in your intro, the people really want to preserve what makes this country great and what, keep, what keeps it good and really improve and enhance our country going forward. How can we uh, say queer? Is that okay to say in today's day? Yes, I in fact like it a little better because I find all the letters unpronounceable and they're at are changing all the time. So I just think queer is something you can pronounce that includes pretty much any sort of designation somebody might use. Now, personally, uh, I've listened to some uh, interviews that you've had. You don't have you don't seem to have a problem with the gay community. You just have a problem with queer politics. Is that is that fair to say? Well, I do. I think the American founders, you know, for example, they the, the usual tack that they took was that if people's behavior did not infringe on others' rights, and it was, you know, something not in the public square, and 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 again, like I said, contributing to public degradation and especially harming children. You know, what what people did privately in their own two homes, the American founders really didn't go into their homes and drag people out, you know, like people have been told about. So I really ascribe to that, you know, so I'm a Christian. I do believe what the Bible says, that God made man and woman to fit together and that people will be happiest, you know, when they're in unions like that. But I, you know, I, I think also that there, people need to have freedom and that many times people don't understand their own good and they need the freedom to explore that own good. So as long as it's not harming my kids, you know, I, I'm not going to be complaining about what people are doing in private. Before you had children, uh, was this a stance you felt strongly about or did having children just enhance uh, that flame that was already uh, lit? Well, that's actually a funny question to me because in college at Hillsdale, I identified as a libertarian feminist, words I would not use to describe myself today. Um, and, and in fact, yeah, I, I would actually consider myself to be anti-feminist and a good deal of my thinking in this book actually relates to that because I think that feminism is the original trans movement because what it really does is basically says that women should act like men. And that's the same thing that transgenderism does. And it's just a lot more obvious when you're actually cutting and pasting body parts and doing things like that. But, you know, asking women to separate their biology from their bodies and, and to be distant and act 
as if they, we are like men, as if we don't bear and nurture the next generation of life. And as if that isn't a massive emotional, physical and spiritual undertaking that requires a major investment of ourselves. And I learned all of that really by becoming a mother. And it's been a very long process, I would say, of um, rethinking um, my, my earlier feminism and my, um, you know, just idea that you no, know, women are basically men with like di slightly different body parts that don't matter at all. I my bo my bond with my children, nursing my children, bearing them has absolutely completely changed and deepened and enriched my understanding of the mm -hmm. biological differences between men and women. So that has absolutely played into um, this topic that we're discussing here. I, I, as I love hearing you say that because uh, so many young people get emotionally wrapped up in different movements, but they're not, we don't become mature <clears throat> till we have some experiences and our brains don't fully mature till especially the men, the men later in life around 26 or 27. And then you have children and you pay a mortgage and you get a job and how you think about the world changes a little bit and, and you're living proof of that, it seems like. Can you talk more about that? Oh, that's absolutely true, right? You know, because when I was young, when you're when you're younger and more and just single, you know, it, it bothers less to you people acting a little weird, cross-dressing even, right? You just think, what does it matter to me? But when you have a three-year-old with you, you think my little girl is just learning about the world and she doesn't really know, you know, how men and women are different and what a big freaking deal that is. And so she could be confused by this. And it also, and I also, you know, in, in my book, I talk about this, you know, por pornographic and sexual exposure at young ages. Absolutely. For example, it can affect children's puberty times. It absolutely affects um, whether they're going to engage in sexual activity at younger ages. The more sex kids see, the earlier they're likely to do it. And again, you know, as a mother, I think sex is wonderful and I don't want my kids to do that before it's a good and right time for them to do that. And so in order to protect my children for that, in order for them to have a happy, innocent childhood, you know, they need to have other people joining in with me and helping me protect my child unless I don't want to be able to take them anywhere. Um, so yeah, I, I would say it's been a complete transformation. <laughs> um, I, mm -hmm. I was, I was, um, you know, pretty girl bossy in my high school and college years. And I actually would like to give a lot of credit to my husband for that because he has been, he is our whole marriage encouraged me. Um, he's in, he's supported me having children. He has, you know, supported me while I've been pregnant and nursing. He's gotten up at night with the baby, but he has always said to me, you know, honey, I think the most important thing that you do is raising the children. You're the one person yes. who, that they absolutely need the most. And, and they express that all the time. And I want to do everything I can to make that possible for you, for you to be happy doing that because he, so, I mean, so his love and acceptance of me as a woman has actually, I would say, propelled that growth of mine from that really immature not understanding how big the differences between men and women are and how they absolutely have to change all of our life decisions and trajectories. Um, my husband has helped teach me that in, in, in a way, and I really appreciate him leading me through that in a very sensitive way, in a non-offensive um, way. And I don't think, I think there's a lot of husbands and brothers and dads who do that sort of thing. They don't get enough credit for um, teaching women that, you know, there's plenty of men out there who will love and respect you and they love what you are as a woman and they're not going to mistreat that, but they're going to really value and prize that. Um, I'm a father, uh, a, a girl dad. I've got a daughter and a, and a son. Uh, my daughter's 25. Um, and I, uh, I love her dearly. Um, when you talk, it makes me think of her. And uh, when she was, I don't know, 12, 14, I read the book, uh, Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters. I believe that's the title. And I gave her, I'm Irish. Uh, her name's Hattie Fitzgerald, uh, after, uh, Fitzgerald after my grandmother. And uh, I gave her a clatter ring because I wanted her to look at that and um, know that her dad loved her, right? And that if, she, you know, most, what I've read is most, young girls will uh, look to men uh, that remind them of their father. So I wanted to be there for her. She now is, uh, wants to be a mom. Well, it was, it was really funny. I mean, so my husband and I married a couple of months after college 
And we, you know, I, I say unexpectedly got pregnant within uh, three months later. And I'm saying un, it, it shouldn't be unexpected, right? Because what do you, you know, what, where do babies come from? We all know that, you know, it's, we were doing the thing that makes babies and we got one. It shouldn't be unexpected. But, you know, we, we think that we can control life. I've, I've been disabused of that a lot all the time. In fact, really, we don't have a lot of control over life. And fertility is one of those things that really put people's lack of control over their own lives. Um, really, it's uncomfortable for people to deal with, especially in modernity with technology. We feel like we can control much more than we really can. But anyway, so, so we got married much more earlier than unexpected. I was the only person in my whole office in that age range who was pregnant. Um, you know, um, and so it was very, I felt like, you know, and, and I was, I was, you know, the only one there who was not all, I mean, very few people were even married at my age, um, right out of college. And then I was pregnant. It was like, oh my word, you know, I just felt really embarrassing, even though nobody ever said anything negative or unkind. In fact, I had the best boss ever who really encouraged and um, endorsed my motherhood. He sent me articles about, you know, how to keep nursing your baby even while working. He just really encouraged me to do things that were really good for my family and to, it was very baby positive, which I know is not the case for many, for many young women. I've heard a lot of horror stories from young women, such as, you know, offices, you know, telling them to get rid of it, et cetera, et cetera. But my, my bosses have always been extremely supportive and I'm very grateful for that. So, you know, but, but yeah, it was, it was, it was psychologically extremely difficult for me to feel like I, I thought I was going to, you know, immediately like launch into a career and here is this baby. What are we going to do with this baby? And my husband was just such a leader in that time for both of us. He told me, you know, he wanted the baby. He was so happy, you know, went to my appointments with me and just in a very, very difficult time, he encouraged me. Um, and, and, you know, from, and, and so it, it was scary. Um, we were, we were in Washington, DC away from both of our families. Um, and, but, you know, through that, I really learned to rely on him and to trust on him. And he showed me that I really could trust him to take care of us when I was in a very vulnerable spot. And I do think, you know, women, we know that we are biologically vulnerable and we are looking for, you know, and I think it's the natural male role to be the protector, the provider and the leader. And when women have men like that in their lives, when we feel safe and secure, then we can move into our femininity and we don't have to be defensively just trying to be worse men all the time, but we can be awesome in what we are created to be as full flowering, you know, females proud and happy of the fact that we do gestate the babies within our bodies and the children really need us to be there for them in a deep way. And I, I talk about this in the book, of course, that the mother and the father absences that so many children have is a very significant contributing factor to people adopting sexual identity politics. Sexual chaos among parents uh, often creates trauma in children's lives that uh, sometimes leads them to identify as transgender or homosexual. And so the sexual revolution is, you know, really degrading family life in a way that's creating new and new kinds of expressions of sadness and trauma. Let's go to break and we will come back. Joy is going to talk about how we rebound as a country by sharing a little bit more insight into her book, False Flag, Why Queer Politics Mean the End of America. OMJ Clothing is an elite men's clothing store that provides a vast array of spectacular brands of men's lifestyle apparel for every day. Elevate your business upscale casual at OMJ. Success comes from standing out. The Rebound is sponsored by Sector Spider ETFs, a unique family of exchange-traded funds that divide the S&P 500 into 11 sector index funds. You can buy just the sectors you like or customize the S&P 500 by weighting the 11 sectors to meet your financial objective. Please visit them on the web at sectorspiders.com. That's sector, S-P-D-R-S dot com. Alps Portfolio Solutions Distributor, a registered broker dealer, is the distributor for the Select Sector Spider Trust. Joy, welcome back. How does our country rebound from our current state of turmoil? Well, I don't really sugarcoat it in the obligatory solutions chapter at the end of the book. I do think uh, in a situation this bad will take a lot of time to rebound, but I do think that it is possible. I think a lot of people, there's a lot of despair and doom saying among people who are aware of how bad things are really in this country, both, you know, financially, politically, and socially. 
things are really bad, but also um, miracles have happened in history a lot more frequently, you know, than some people uh, give it credit for. And it and um, there also have been some surprising turnarounds, even in American history. There's been a number of points, for example, you know, before the Civil War, and people really thought America was going to crack up. And again, that was brutal. It was terrible. Mm -hmm. But you know, we're still a United States of America. And I do think the right side won there, right? So we have not only global, but personal American history. The Revolutionary War never should have been won. You know, people who uh, read the history about that, um, it, it was, you know, uh, it was put together by a bunch of ragtag misfits. They didn't even have the majority of people who wanted to leave England. You know, um, the obvious, you know, everyone knows the story, right? It's total underground miracle right. fact that, and multiple times throughout the battle, such as the Battle of Trenton, New Jersey, and so forth, it was just the hand of Providence moved in American history, and I think that it can do so again. But, you know, Providence, Providence does use human, human actors like you and me. Um, and so people, individuals who are Americans, who love our country, we have choices to make how we can spend our time, spend our money. And I do think, um, for example, one of the things that I am super excited about is I, 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 I believe that especially, I mean, we know that boomers have the largest amount of wealth, you know, in world history as a generation and a class. And so I think that there are ways that boomers, and they also are, you know, speaking as a millennial, you know, who is both working and has children at the same time, very tied up in terms of time. If you're retired, working part-time, you know, post-retirement, you also have a golden gift of time that you can give to people, you know, be, be in, in those years between retirement and when it's harder for you to physically help others. So those are two major assets that I really think could be deployed in this crucial moment before the boomers, you know, sail off to meet their maker. They could be using those resources to really uh, make play the long game for the benefit of the country that many of them love. So I think some really great investments would be, for example, alternative education systems. You know, the public education system has never been at a lower point than it is now. And it really has not, you know, since post COVID, you know, the thing that they dove into basically to recover their legitimacy has been all of this identity politics, BLM trans stuff. That's not winning any more people. You know, I just see um, the entire education system. I mean, higher education, I was just talking to a professor today who's telling me, you know, that his students um, have you know, very deep mental health problems, more than he's ever seen in a generation. He can't get them to read. This is, you know, at a ritzy, yeah, you know, at a, at a, at a you know, it's not a blue collar, you know, community college level school. This is happening to, you know, the kids of white collar people, right? So I think our entire education system is clearly right for a shakeup. And it's just at the time at which it's completely suffused with these chaotic sexual politics and the lack of ability to help people recover from their traumas that are related to them. So I think big investments in time and money can be made into private school systems, into charter school systems into, I'm a big proponent of classical education, but basically, and there are, there are so many things wrong with the country that you can probably pick just about anything that you are good at, that you love, that you have an interest in, and you can do some real legitimate good there just because there's so many things wrong and everywhere is right for some help. Yeah, I, I, I uh, as you say that, um, in my backyard uh, of um, Charlotte, North Carolina, Melissa Gibbs, Joe Gibbs's uh, daughter-in-law, who lost her husband, uh, started a new high school that's opening up here this fall called the Ambassador School. And it's a Christian high school um, that uh, shares all the values that you're talking about. And so uh, people need to, you know, feel that they can make a difference. Um, uh, and a, a lot of times we may not be able to feel, people may not be able to feel they can because the media. Now, you've been in the media for a while now. Um, why, why is the media generally controlled by the left side of the aisle? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that. I think currently the biggest one is just that the big tech is a censorship monopoly over all the internet airwaves. And the internet is basically, you know, the community through which almost all the communications in this country flow. I don't know. I mean, I actually do personally write letters still, but you know, not <laughs> most people don't, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and we don't put, you know, we have our daily conversations through text, through chats, mm -hmm. you know, through emails and all the rest. And so if you have big tech monopolies that are basically have, government favoritism gives them the ability to control all the information flow, then you're handing over, you know, Google, you know, more 98%, I believe, 
95, 98%, you know, of their employee donations have gone to Democrats, right? Huge, huge left-wing player. They have people who, big executives at Google who left to, you know, work on the campaigns of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. These are super, super left organizations and they don't even hide it. So but I also think that, you know, the, the hearkening to my earlier point, a lot of the internet, you know, news is, um, is also kind of, Consuming too much of it really gets people locked into a cycle of despair because yep. there is not much that you and I can do about national politics. Um, and national politics is really a mess. But there is some that, that having that feeling and having that, you know, the Internet also just kind of it's like staring at the TV. Right. It gives you this feeling of helplessness and you just sit there, you know, getting, you know, less healthy on your couch, can doom scrolling, you know, through the news. And I think. But there's a lot that people can do in their individual lives with their children, their grandchildren and their neighbors. You know, you may not be able to fix public schools in the country, right. but you can make sure that your grandkids are able to go to a Christian school yep. or be homeschooled. Maybe you personally could homeschool them. Maybe you could support, you know, your, your grandkids family to make it possible in whatever way either, you know, you can watch the kids, you know, for mom to work part time from home mm -hmm. or whatever the case is, you can maybe donate for the kids to help go to a private Christian school, buy the supplies for their homeschooling. And there's a lot of different creative ways people could come up with, but every single individual could do something in your own life. Even if it's reading good books to your grandkids when you go over for a visit, there is a tangible contribution you can make to the life of someone that you know um, that absolutely does change them. I don't know about you, Matt. I'm sure you have personal stories about this. I bet all of us have personal stories of someone you know being in their life who completely changed the course of their life. I've had professors who have been like that to me. I um, had an art teacher in high school who was like that to me. Obviously, parents and grandparents are huge, hugely influential on people. Each one of us can be that kind of a person to someone else. And our mm -hmm. person and, and what we choose to do with our time and invest in other people, it absolutely does make a difference for the sometimes for the entire rest of the life of the person that you are investing in. Well, that's why I got into coaching, uh, Joy. I worked on Wall Street and it was all about making money. And I look back on the impact uh, my coaches had on me from grammar school to high school to college and uh, wanted to be able to have that impact. And now I'm an executive coach, uh, not a basketball coach. And, uh, um, and, and you know, want to leave. My mission is to make a positive impact on the people I meet and the groups I work with while dropping breadcrumbs to the Lord. And I think when we find our purpose, totally, um, which is mine is to teach and coach. Um, and that's what I try to do through this show is to teach and coach and educate uh, while dropping breadcrumbs to the Lord and not being afraid of that. Um, because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. uh, my goal is to get what I call the big house. I want to get to the big house. And uh, when God, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, hopefully will say uh, job well done. Um Amen to that. Joy, uh, you're a leader. Uh, thank you for joining us today on The Rebound. And thank you for having me. Leadership is a learned behavior. We all lead in some way, shape, or form. We all deal with adversity. And when you do, I challenge you to rebound. I challenge you to learn and grow. If you'd like to contact me, you can reach me at DohertyCoaching.com. That's D-O-H-E-R-T-Y dot com. Thanks for tuning in.